Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, Chris Tarr is with us, but so is Jeff McGinley. Both of these guys and myself have a little bit of experience now in virtualizing broadcast operations, and we're having some cool success with it. Jeff's going to tell you about his amazing story from Portland, Oregon, about his stations going homeless. And Chris Tarr has some consolidation stories about a data center that they own. It's coming up next on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics with the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio. Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel, worry-free transmission you can count on with outstanding control, reliability, efficiencies, and Nautel's unmatched 24-7 customer support online at Nautel.com. And by MaxConnect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from uh, the microphone to that light bulb at the top of the tower. I'm Kirk Harnack, so glad that you are here with us. Uh, I am in my radio station in Oxford, Mississippi. Brand new radio station. Well, okay, a uh, month, month and a half, maybe two months old. And we'll talk about some of the cool things that we're doing here along with uh, a guest of ours. But first, but first, it's Chris Tarr from McWanago, Wisconsin. Isn't that where you are, Chris? Uh-oh, microphone. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. I always do that. I, boy, getting old. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> thanks much. Uh, happy to be here today. And, uh, you know, you said, you know, you got to get to the good part, which is really the end of the show, I think. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, here in McGuanago, Wisconsin, uh, I, you know, on the road actually a lot this week. We'll probably talk about that a little bit with uh, the data center stuff. And yeah. uh, according to McGuanagoweather.com, it is 62 degrees. And partly sunny here in McGuanago. Well, those temperature sensors are right nearby you, aren't they? McGuanago weather is on my back porch, actually. <laughs> Gee, all right. Oh, I, we, 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 Chris, we got to do another whole show, just, just you and me. Uh, we, you know, we, we, without a guest to ruin it all. Speaking of, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I want to bring in. I'm so glad that Jeff could join us today. Seriously, one of my I favorite people. I, I don't know if I'm happy about it now at this point. You're going to come in so hot like that on me. Right. Yeah, we, we have a lovely we have a lovely guest. Couldn't join us today, so we've got Jeff McKinnon. <laughs> hey, Jeff, it's so good to see you from Birmingham, Alabama. How you, how you doing? Good to see you guys. Yeah, how's your weather there? Probably sunny, hot, and humid. Uh, it's not so humid today. It's about eighty two or three right now it's actually pretty nice considering the summer that we had oh you know, okay. just walking out to the car was was enough to drench you in sweat so this is this is lovely this is great you know but it's, i'm still trying lovely. to get used to the weather down here I, uh, we were uh carmen and i were at the uh mississippi association of broadcasters annual convention they often hold it uh on the gulf coast in biloxi mississippi with the casinos because you know there's lots of hotel rooms there and meeting rooms. This year, they held it in Natchez, Mississippi, a very famous old town and uh, and quite a beautiful, uh, quaint downtown, too. Uh, and, you know, the Old Man River just rolling on by there. And so we were in Natchez for a couple of days. We did uh, some uh, seminars there, talked to a bunch of station owners, and uh, got a great concert from the Jackson State University marching band. Holy cow, they are amazing. Um, and on the way back, we, uh, we drove through Cleveland, Mississippi, made a quick stop at a transmitter site, verified an air conditioner problem, and then driving to Oxford, the fastest way was to go right past Parchman State Penitentiary, where they have signs, you know, don't pick up hitchhikers. So that's, that's where we were an hour and a half ago, driving by Parchman. What do you think of that? <laughs> Interesting. So did you stop <laughs> yep. and... To just stop and say hi to your old friends and everything while you're there. <laughs> my old my old radio friends. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's a few that might could go there, but no, no. These these are the hardcore criminals. They're, they're the AM and the FM guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Well, next time you pass uh, by, give me a souvenir, would you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they they discourage slowing down and stopping as yeah. you as you drive drive. Here, by. here, Jeff. I got you this shiv. <laughs> I don't know where, where where is your sense of adventure, Kirk? I, you know, it's uh 
Oh my gosh. Well, uh, the topic for today, we're going to be talking about uh, virtualized broadcast infrastructure. And we've covered that in lots of different ways uh, over the last year or two. Uh, Jeff McGinley, our guest, has a lot of real world experience with that because of a kind of a station group uh, semi emergency that that he put up with and 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 helped some stations through. Um, Chris Tarr is going to give us a little bit update on on what they're doing for virtualization. And here where I am, let me back out of the way a little bit. I'm in a control room that has no no physical audio console. It's got you know a touch screen, and where this console that you're seeing right here is actually at the transmitter site. That's where the actual gain controls are. So it's pretty cool. Our morning guy, uh, Chris Green, comes in here every day and does his show from right here, but everything's at the transmitter site, which means this room could be anywhere. It could be at Chris Green's house. It could be at my house. If I had the, to do the morning show, that would be just terrible. Uh, but this is this is kind of an interesting uh, way, one way that the future might look. So we'll be talking about that. Uh, this Week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by Nautel Transmitters. There's one of those right now powering this station uh, and the HD stations as well. Nautel has got some more Transmission Talk Tuesday roundtable discussions coming up in October. And I wish you'd go register for those. If you go to nautel.com slash webinars, there, and there's the website right there on the screen, nautel.com slash webinars, and click on Transmission Talk Tuesday. Uh, this uh, this month, transmitter, transmitter site considerations uh, coming up in uh, on October uh, let's see, it's the 17th, um, antennas, lines, combiners, uh, and things like that. That's October 17th. And then October 31st, air handling and cooling. Ooh, we could use that today at one of my transmitter sites. We have two of those barred air conditioners, and neither one of them is working. I, I, think, they, uh, I think they must have sprung a leak. But uh, uh, they'll be talking about that on Transmission Talk Tuesday from Nautel. So check it out. Uh, just go online, register. Nautel will remind you the day before, and they'll remind you an hour before. And other than that, I don't think you'll hear from them. They won't bother you or spam you, but they sure will uh, remind you about going to the webinar. And it's not a webinar in the traditional sense. It's a roundtable discussion. They'll present ideas and information for you, but you as a participant, uh, you get to raise your hand and ask a question. And uh, hey, they may even give you the microphone if you need to ask for a Thanks a lot, Nautel, nautel.com slash webinars for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. All right, I'm Kirk Harnack in Oxford, Mississippi today at WBZK FM, HD1, HD2, HD3. We're running a total of three different formats here. But more importantly than that, we got this, this virtual stuff here. But we're going to look at my stuff later. I want to hear what Chris and Jeff have to say. And Jeff's our guest. So, uh, Chris, you and I are going to what we're going to in, make inquiry uh, with Jeff here as to his experience with the virtualized broadcast system. So Jeff, I think you've got a whole story to tell about about Portland, Oregon, and yep, uh, we, the, uh, the fact that you were homeless. Yeah. So we we were moving to a new studio location, and uh, there's some you know dragging of the feet, and the new facility was not going to be ready in time, and the landlord of the old facility would not. We would not extend our, our lease, even by a few months. And so we had to figure out how to keep all seven of our stations on the air, uh, you know, with spots and everything like that. Uh, and we had morning shows on four of the seven stations. Um, and then our AIM Sports Talker had at least 13 hours worth of live uh, content every day. So uh, I reached out to some friends at Telos, and they, uh, they recommended Altus which is what we ended up using. So put all of our servers at a centralized transmitter site, including the Altus server, um, so that all of the individual automation system channels could come up on it. And then uh, we had five various uh, studio kits that we sent out to guest bedrooms all around the Portland area. And we broadcast like that for about four months. In fact, I think one of those, one of those morning shows is still doing it to this day. They're still using it. Can't hear you. Yeah. Are, are they doing that uh, morning show from a home or from a rented office space? What kind of space are they in? It is a married couple. So they are doing it. They took a, a spare guest bedroom and they have a small child. So it really worked out really well. Uh, they took a guest bedroom, got some, some nice furniture in there, and basically 
So instead of having to find a, a babysitter or something like that, that early in the morning that they had to be there, they're literally walking from their bedroom directly over to their studio. Ah, so 4 a.m., you give the kids some Benadryl, tell them to stay awake for about, uh, stay asleep for about four hours. Mommy and daddy going to do a show. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. So yeah, kidding, that, that, do, was this, that, that was the special consideration for that one is that they're a married morning show. It just made sense for them to just to continue to use it. And it's been flawless. I mean, it really, um, it, it, ever since we deployed it, it's just worked. And I was really kind of worried about a couple of my uh, older jocks that they wouldn't be able mm-hmm. to pick it up. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it is kind of a, a change from an old pr e board or anything like that. But it took about one air shift and they had it. They, they had it down. So, so I, I, I want to I go back and, and put what you said a little bit different way, because I, sometimes I, I think that what we're talking about here isn't, isn't always clear um, because it's, it's, a, it's kind of such a new concept. Normally, you have your automation systems and your audio consoles and your microphones and headphones all in the same place. That is at the radio station, at the brick and mortar radio station. Whether you have the transmitter there or at the station or not, you know, some small town, some small towns, you, you've got the tower out back, you know, um, th- that's really not so, so material here. But what you guys, you guys were going to lose your, your studio space. So you had to do something. And you thought, well, wait a minute, we can put our automation systems and our mixing consoles in a safe, secure place, the transmitter site, because you have a really good transmitter site for several of those stations in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I understood that you had you know, a great source of uh, AC power, backup generator, and you had more than one source of internet at this hilltop facility. Have I got that about right? Absolutely. Yeah, you nailed it. So we, we dropped in a different internet circuit so that we had redundant paths on different carriers just in case we, you know, one experienced a backhoe fade. Uh, we yeah. had five racks. We had all seven stations in five racks. We had to fly a new three meter dish out the back to get the satellite contents because oh, uh, yeah. the, the 25 to 30 year old dish was falling apart. So uh, yeah, everything the, for the vast majority of, of all the content generating stuff at the transmitter site, at a centralized transmitter site. Now, Chris, it, maybe you've got a similar experience. Perhaps you don't, but it, at my stations in Mississippi, we first experienced the notion of putting the automation at the transmitter site and having it unmanned uh, with our station in Greenwood, Mississippi. Uh, We lost our morning guy and we couldn't find a good replacement. Uh, At the same time, the landlord was way upping the rent on the studio space. So we said, you know what? We're doing a a syndicated morning show and that's working great. and the rest of our, our day is voice tracked. And I think we do an overnight show that comes in syndicated by FTP. So let's just put the automation, the audio processing, the stream encoding, the ingest computer, you know, with Mr. Master on it. Let's just put all that at the transmitter side because we have good power at the transmitter side. And our, that transmitter side happens to be the head end for a wireless ISP as well. So there's a tower there. Uh, that we were on anyway, and and we had you know good reliable internet because if the internet goes out, this guy's on it, right? He's got to have internet to serve his you know hundreds and hundreds of, of customers. So we we did that. We did that. I don't know two and a half three three years ago. It was before COVID, and it worked. It worked well for us. Now we weren't doing any live shows on that station, uh, so everything was ingested. We still had we had regular regular access to tweak things, and of course at the transmitter site, it had to ingest you know, all the various close to live, not quite live, but close to live programming. And that worked really well. And so we as a group, Delta Radio, we became comfortable with the idea of, ha- of everything had to be remote accessed. And uh, with the exception of uh, half a day of no internet, uh, and believe me, the ISP owner, you know, was all over that. Uh, and it, it has worked out very well. And so when we moved here to Oxford, Mississippi and bought some stations, we had to think about, and I'll tell the story later, but we had to think about what might we want to do here that's a little not non-traditional. Um, uh, Jeff, why don't you uh, kind of continue with more detail on, since I've kind of restated what, what you said, that the notion that everything doesn't have to be at the studio. You could put all this gear at the transmitter site and remote control it in, in some way. What would you like to add to your story? Well, how about this? The fact that we're about to deploy Altus again with uh, with my new company here, 
we're building a broadcast studio in a restaurant in Gatlinburg, and we're going to use Altus uh, to transport all of the audio back to the station for broadcast. So, I mean, it, it works so well that we're just, it's just a, it was a, an easy uh, thing to say, like, well, we're not going to use a codec to get the audio back. We're just going to use Altus altogether. Well, so, I, and I, yeah, th then that deserves a little bit of, of explanation. Uh, Altus is a software audio console that, that resides uh, not necessarily where the people who are manipulating the controls, it's not where they are. They're using a browser to manipulate it. But the codec you're talking about, since everything is software and the control is over uh, an HTML5 browser, which they all are and have been since 2018, that contains the WebRTC architecture and that's how people do, you know, Google Meet and and other, you know, live meeting programs. So I think I hear you implying, Jeff, that the codec, the audio codec, is built in. Uh, at least it is on on the client end. It's in the browser, right? Right. Nailed it again. WebRTC is the the transport delivery method to get the audio back from the this remote studio to the station. Um, and as soon as the so we're going to have a couple of desktop computers, but let's say it's this laptop. As soon as this laptop launches and launches the WebRTC and connects back to the server, the server treats it as a true codec with a full mix minus and everything else. So it, it's it's really quite flawless when it comes to that. Very easy. So th that mix minus, uh, now that actually comes from the Altus Audio Console software that's running as a Docker container. And so that's the the, so the same software, or very close to the same software that uh, that Telos Telos Alliance Axia has been using in their IQ series of consoles for years. So that is well established code uh, that that is in uh, the IQ series of consoles. When Telos added this notion of just browse into it, we'll give you a representation of the console, and if you're remote and you have you know paid for WebRTC. Uh, we will uh, we'll we'll create a mix minus. We'll connect it to a WebRTC server, and I'm I'm going to need you to explain that in a minute. Uh, and then a remote person can can connect to that uh, that technology, and then you have an a, an audio codec connection. They're using a codec that's built into the browser. It's it's using the Opus uh, open source codec uh, or the Opus you know non proprietary codec. So uh, um, tell you what, we, let's let's do let's do a quick break. And then we'll talk about WebRTC. That that's a. Uh, it, it might take all three of us to, to unpack that uh, to the best of our knowledge, which may not be complete. Uh, but I'd like to understand this this WebRTC. It's a little more complicated than I thought it was. Um, but what Jeff's saying is that that uh, um, when, when you bring up a remote codec on the audio console, and actually on this console behind me, this first fader here, it says studio up there. This console is physically at the transmitter site, and and it's receiving the output of a little mixer here in this studio over the internet, over WebRTC, 128 kilobit opus, and it's at the same time sending a mix minus back here to this studio or wherever you are connecting to it. And uh, yesterday at the Mississippi Broadcasters, I connected to this remote one um, uh, with, a, with a Chromebook. And with a Chromebook, I had a conversation back and forth with our morning guy here. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to explain that in, in a few minutes. This week in Radio Tech with Chris Tarr and Jeff McGinley and me, Kirk Harnack. Uh, it's brought to you in part by our good friends at Broadcast Bionics. And they have some amazing stuff at Broadcast Bionics. I think uh, Suncast probably has, a, has an ad to roll right now. Let's take a look at it. Camera One from Broadcast Bionics. Designed to bring video to your audio content. Visualizing radio and podcasts for social media. Camera One can automatically create, capture, and brand professionally switched video for live streaming or upload, making your production shareable. Control and configure using a web browser on any device. Camera One is available as a 4-camera or 8-camera system using the Blackmagic A10 Mini range, including the A10 Mini Extreme. You can use cameras to suit your studio and your budget. You'll need one camera for a studio wide shot and usually one camera per microphone. A standard multi-channel sound card or IP driver monitors audio from each studio microphone and we work natively with Axia systems. Ideally, this will be a post-fader feed from each mic, although you can use pre-fade audio or a mic split if that's all you have available. 
These audio levels are used to intelligently switch the video feed when each contributor is talking. You can also group microphones together into one shot and use the audio from a mixer's aux bus. You can use Camera One's auto switch feature or disable it and switch using the on-screen buttons or the buttons on the ATEM. Recordings can automatically start when you tell the system you're on the air. This on-air indication can be linked to your studio's red lights via IP or an Avantec Adam GPIO interface. You can quickly browse all the videos that have been automatically created during your broadcast, download them and post. Camera One is a user installable system. You'll need a good spec Windows 10 PC, i7 with plenty of storage and 16 gig of RAM. It's better if this machine isn't used for anything else. Remember, you can control the software in a web browser on another device on your network. Camera One, a thrifty way of creating scroll-stopping video from your show or podcast from Broadcast Bionics. Broadcast Bionics, a proud sponsor of This Week in Radio Tech, and we're so delighted to be partnered up with them and all the amazing uh, studio helpers that they make. Anything from uh, uh, phone screening programs like X-Screen, uh, to the whole uh, uh, Bionic Studio suite of, of uh, products. You can get them uh, piece by piece or get the whole thing. And Camera One, another terrific product from Broadcast Bionics. Thanks a lot. Oh, and their newest thing, Virtual Rack, which lets you do some of the things that we're talking about here pretty easily. You plug in the, the surfer and you choose the apps you want to run. Uh, you install them with a click, and then you license them from their respective manufacturers. And bam, thanks a lot, uh, Broadcast Bionics. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack here in Oxford, Mississippi at WBZK, uh, which is an alt ro alternate rock station, alternative rock station. And then we have HD2, which is oldies, and HD3, which is uh, kind of a light urban, an urban AC format. Uh, along with me is uh, Chris Tarr in McWanago, Wisconsin. Chris is uh, Director of Engineering, VP of Engineering for uh, a bunch of radio stations in, uh, in that area, Magnum Media. And Jeff McGinley is here. He's VP of Engineering for Summit Media in Birmingham. So, gentlemen, welcome in. Glad you're here. Um, uh, I, I wanted to, uh, because I've got it up and running and I don't want the, uh, don't want to time out on the screen because I went to some trouble here. Let me show you. Okay. So here, um, this is a windows 11 computer that's just sitting in our control room and that's a browser. It's full screen. Here's a Chromebook and it's dialed in to the same console. And in fact, uh, I have, a, in fact, let, let me disconnect it so that we can watch it connect. Um, let me go back to, so. This is on Wi-Fi. It could be anywhere. It's here. And if I move the, let's say, the fader up and down, back behind me, see my finger on the fader here? Move that up and down. Look at that. It moves, it moves up and down. Well, of course it didn't. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> what? What? I think I need to refresh the browser. I think during the break, the browser decided to, uh, okay, there we go. Now it's refreshed. There you go. Now it's moving up and down. See? Do, 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 do. How about that? And if I, for example, hit this button off, if I turn the studio off, why, looky here, it, it turned off over here. If I turn it on over here, it turned back on here. So the point is you can have several people running the board at the same time if, you know, if you want to. Uh, what could more go wrong with that? People fighting over. <laughs> well, that's over the right. Board. People fighting over. I'm going to turn his microphone. I don't like what he's saying right now. Um, with, and of course, you don't have to. Now, if you're just a remote uh, guest, uh, you don't have to bring the console up. You know, you could give a link out to somebody and all they would have on their screen is this. This is the remote WebRTC access, okay? And if I hit the connect button right here, this is a touch screen. If I connect, you can see that the Chromebook is using its built-in microphone. It, it could be a USB mic. That would be smarter, it'd be better quality. But look over here, look at the console here now. It's taken my voice from this Chromebook and through the magic of the interwebs, Here's the, the pre-fader level. That's the confidence meter level, okay? In fact, I could turn that Master on. Oh, the bus. that's my mix minus feed <laughs> coming from here. When I, when I turn, the, the, the Altus console can be set up such that when the fader is off, it doesn't send mix minus. It does a talk around. And when the fader is on, it sends mix minus. So I could turn that down and turn it back up. And anyway... So that is, that is just so cool. And all that is uh, being handled by a Linux computer at the transmitter site. It happens to be about three miles away from here. Uh, but you know, obviously, this Chromebook could be anywhere. And yesterday, it was in Natchez, Mississippi, doing a 
similar demo. We were talking back and forth to Chris Green right here in this in the same room. So I uh, hope that makes things a little bit more clear. The Opus Codec built-in WebRTC lets you contribute and hear at the same time um, to what, what's going on. You can also get a version of it that just lets you listen. So if you have somebody that just needs to listen and control, maybe they're running a remote ball game, they don't need to contribute. They just need to listen and you know run spots and things like that. They can, they can do that. All right, so now that you've seen that demo, does that uh, uh, kind of, hope that kind of clears up a little bit about what, what can be done, what can be connected. Um, Jeff, what, what can you tell us about WebRTC? I heard about this the first time maybe seven or eight years ago. And, uh, I'm not exactly I, I, the expert of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not. I don't. I don't know if I can actually speak, you know, uh, in an edu educated manner about that. Um, so, so there's, well, I, you know, I, it works. It, it works. Uh, and Jeff, you can verify this and correct me if I'm wrong. Then, and Chris Tarr, if you have something to jump in and contribute, please do. Um, WebRTC. I thought WebRTC was something that was like built into the web page server. So if I go to a website. Uh, like uh, that, that lets me listen to something or contribute. Uh, that that the web RTC was something inherent or built into the web server engine, and that's not the case. Uh, that is not the case at all. It turns out that web RTC is a separate uh, service, and it can run in the same server that is serving out the web page, but more likely, it's going to run in a different container on the same or a different computer. It can even be running in a different location. In other words, WebRTC and the services around that that make it work conveniently don't have to be co-located with the, the server that's serving out the web page. So uh, there, and that implies, and it's true, there are third-party WebRTC uh, services that you can contract with. I think there may even be a free one or two out there. Uh, that I'm sure there's a catch you're, you're paying. You know, you're the product somehow. Um, and and WebRTC involves uh, a little bit more than just you know connecting audio and video together or being an Opus codec or or coder or decoder. Uh, you also have to incorporate um, the technology that it would take to get through a firewall, and that's usually done with a what they call stun and turn servers, or more commonly now something's combined. They call it a coturn server. And so that it's it's kind of like a rendezvous server. So it allows a web page at a client's location. So that would be you know in in my Chromebook here. When I go to connect um, here, I'll disconnect. When I go to when I bring up this web page, I in the code I'm also pinging a a a, a coturn server. I'm saying hey, I've got this invitation, this this web URL, and uh, I'm I'm when I hit this button here, I want to connect. And uh, the server is telling it, you know, about itself too. And so when I connect, it, it, it is allowing me to get through my firewall in two directions, outbound and inbound, so that we can talk uh, either through the coturn server or it's going it's to try to hand it off directly uh, from the uh, Axia Altus and its codec capabilities directly to this without being proxied or rendez you know, going through the uh, the coturn server. So there's some other um, technologies that are involved in making all this work, or with any website that's using WebRTC in order to let you communicate, either listen or have two-way communications. Um, so, ooh, hope that's a, a bit of an explanation. Jeff, did I say anything that's at odds with with what your understanding is? No, I think that's that's uh, you, you said it much better than I could have. Um, so. Okay. I do know that you can spin up your own. Um, so that it, with Altus, it was it's called the Beacon server that that yeah. does the connection, and it can actually uh, host the audio between you know the server, the client, and the server. Uh, just for uh, we we found this out our, the hard way uh, more than a few times. So if you have the option of spinning up your own server and having it inside your network, do it. Because we had many a time when our firewall team would push a uh, an update or a policy update, and all mm -hmm. of a sudden, all of our stations went off the air because we couldn't reach the beacon server. So uh, if you have uh, the ability to spin up your own and keep it inside your network, do it. What about you, Chris Tarr? You've uh, you deal deal with so much IT stuff, and even if you haven't done a lot of the web RTC, does anything I say sound wrong, or is that at odds with? your own understanding of these technologies? 
Uh, no, not at all. And in fact, um, <clears throat> one of the reasons it works is because of the fact that you're basically, instead of needing uh, an inbound port open, it just follows the traffic that the outbound request is making. So, oh, that's important. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, and and so, um, one thing that a a broadcaster, um, if you're implementing Axia Altus or m many other uh, technologies like this, you do have to have a security certificate. And so, uh, you can. There's a free security certificate service uh, called Let's Encrypt. And you can generate an SSL certificate with that. Um, uh, and th uh, then um, there's another, uh, and, and th that's what we're using here. It expires after three months. So before three months goes by, I just need to do a couple things with Let's Encrypt, uh, put that blob of information uh, in a publicly accessible place, and then something else goes and gets it and makes a, a certificate. Um, and and that, that keeps the, the communications encrypted. So uh, it can't, it's, Either it can't be, or it's much more difficult to, you know, do something nefarious to it. I got that kind of right. Anybody mm -hmm. know? Okay. Yeah, and you can you can get certificates from like GoDaddy. I think I pay ninety nine dollars a year for mine, and they expire yearly. Uh, yeah. So yeah, um, there's a whole bunch of different ways to do that. Uh, you know, most of them, uh, you know, cost money. And then like you see, you know, you mentioned Let's Encrypt. Um, that's you know, that's the catch with that is that requires a little more work um, as opposed to set it and forget it. Uh, but yeah, you know, and, and that, I think a lot of people are originally, you know, at, at first a little intimidated by that process, but, uh, you know, it's relatively simple. Uh, for example, my edge device, uh, holds the certificate for mine. Uh, and so everything in and out, uh, is just automatically encrypted, whether or not it's, you know, whatever device it is, because the inbound, uh, URL or the inbound network address, uh, has the certificate in the router. So uh, that's how we do ours. You know, one, one of the companies that got us uh, a bit acclimated to the idea of having to use certificates uh, with, with communications like this uh, was actually Comrex and their Opal product. Uh, if you bought it, now I think they may have a, a workaround now, but uh, er, early days you bought an Opal, um, uh, which let people connect through a, a web browser like this to do morning shows and interviews and things like that. Um, you had to get a certificate and, and a lot of, I know and some engineers went, that's too much trouble. Well, no, that's, that's the way of the world. That's, that's the way we do things right now to keep uh, some modicum of security. Well, yeah, you have to, and, and in my data center, you know, we've got so many different services going in and out that, you know, it was pretty much a necessity to do that. So, uh, Jeff, you mentioned earlier about you're putting in another Axia Altus and there's a studio uh, in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, uh, kind of very, a very touristy place, a uh, famous country artist uh, has a, a studio there. Uh, and you mentioned you're using Altus to send the audio. Now, am I, I'm guessing Altus is like at a radio station, and this is a remote studio that is going to use a browser to send and receive audio, right? Correct. This is going to be a, a remote studio in a restaurant that we're building. And uh, we're using Altus, and this also kind of facilitated the fact that we're also going to... Uh, upgrade all the studio infrastructure to Livewire and Xnodes and rip out some old Logitech TDM stuff. So it, it started out as a small project of just building this small remote studio until all of a sudden it exploded to we're going to change everything. So um, the Alta server will be at the studio. We're going to have, we're deploying four Livewire studios. Two of them will be Altus even back inside the, the station, inside the studio walls. They're going to use Altus in the mm -hmm. studios. And then the okay. other two studios will be IQX. And you mentioned something that uh, I should have at the beginning. Uh, this kind of uh, audio console that's that's virtual, um, that doesn't have to be you're going to use it remote. You can use it in the same building, on the same LAN. In fact, if you've already got uh, you know an Axial Livewire AES67 infrastructure going on, well, it's just that much more convenient, you know, to, to use it. In fact, I've got a couple of radio stations here in the Mississippi Delta where we have um, Axia element consoles and they're getting pretty old. And there's going to come a time when they, they may not be fixable because, you know, some parts are just not obtaining them anymore. Uh, they're all, some of them are almost, almost 20 years old, like 17 years old uh, for one of them. And, and if and when it dies, um, Instead of buying a new hardware console, I'd rather just put in 
something like Axial Altus or IQS, and then have right behind this computer is literally a two hundred dollar B Link brand uh, computer that's running Windows eleven. That's what it came with, and the key was this particular B Link computer had two network interfaces, so I could use one for the business network, and I knew that I was going to be using this computer. I, I knew that I would be using its browser to also connect audio, you know, with that connection that I showed you on the, on the Chromebook. So that's happening right now in the background uh, on a tab, on a browser tab. And so it's going to have audio coming in, which is the audio being sent over the public internet uh, to the Altus console, and audio coming out, which is the mix minus audio. And they, you know, come in and out from the Axia network that's right here in this room. Um, uh, and, and so uh, this computer came with two network interfaces, and indeed, one is for the business network, and one's for the uh, the audio over IP network. So that works out really well. That we can keep, you know, have both on there and, and keep them easily separated and easily accounted for. Um, if you're if you have this in a building where you, all your stuff is live wire anyway, uh, it's just it's very convenient to hook that kind of stuff up. Um, and I, I take it that's that's what you're doing in studio in your brick and mortar there that's correct we're gonna have we're gonna uh thankfully rip out some logitech consoles and you know throw them away uh and then we're just gonna install a touch screen with a computer and so whether or not so we're gonna use uh the remote studio is gonna be shared by two different stations so no matter if they are out at the remote studio or they're inside the building they're gonna still use altus for everything tell you what um we're going to take a, an, another break here. When we come back, um, Chris is going to detail some of uh, some of his virtualization that he's done, or an IT center where they're taking care of things that you might normally do at each individual station and have you know a lot of duplication of effort. Uh, but Chris has consolidated a lot of functionality into one place where uh, since the internet you know works well, good good uh, speeds, uh, whether it's fiber or you know cable. Uh, modem connected. Uh, you can get really good performance. And so he's going to tell us something about that. Uh, you're watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack. I'm a WBZK in Oxford, Mississippi, a station where we've implemented a lot of virtualization here. Uh, everything you're looking at is actually at the transmitter site. Automation system, audio console, and uh, and some routing and switching going on there. Uh, but we remote control it from the studio, this office park. Uh, which, by the way, doesn't have line of sight with the transmitter. They would not let us put any kind of tower or STL antenna here. So we don't depend on an internet connection between here and the transmitter to stay on the air. Not at all. We only use that internet connection when we're doing a live morning show and only for the mics, not for the uh, uh, music or spots. Those are all as tucked away at the transmitter site. So uh, we're going to be uh, uh, hearing, or I'm, let's tell you, we're going to take a look at something really cool in this commercial break, and that is uh, from Innovonics. I think Suncast probably has a, a live image ready for us to have a look at. There you go. This is, oh my goodness, this is in Cleveland, Mississippi. Uh, and you guys are familiar with this. This is an Innovonics uh, tuner. Uh, it's an Aaron. I believe this one is the 650. Just a few feet away from me here at my station here in, in uh, Oxford is an Aaron 655, which does HD radio. Uh, this Aaron 650, it's really meant to be a rebroadcast receiver. So it, you know, it's meant to go like at a translator site. So you're picking up a station off the air, uh, or you can also pick up a station via a uh, streaming. And it's got a built-in audio processor and stereo generator, and, and can shove that back out to your S your uh, uh, translator transmitter. Well, we use it for something a little bit different. Uh, we have so many stations in Mississippi in the Delta area that uh, sometimes it's hard to figure out. Uh, some listeners called and said, we're off the air. Well, is the transmitter off? Or is, it, is there uh, just no audio? Uh, uh, just what, what, is, it, is it on low power? Did, did the antenna ice up? What's going on? Well, we have this uh, Innovonics Aaron 650 at a uh, central location where we have an outdoor uh, antenna on this thing. And we can pick up almost, with the exception of one, we can pick up all of our radios to all of our FM stations from this one location. And so we can also remotely listen. Uh, if you take a look at the, at, at the screen here, there's a listen button 
in the upper left where you can choose the bit rate and, and hit the listen button. And so you can listen to the radio and we can just tune around to our different FM stations. It also shows you the RDS. And this is great for setting up your RDS data and making sure that your title and artist are rotating properly on the various different uh, RDS uh, display possibilities. If you have alternate frequencies, whether those are, are transmitting properly. So it is just really cool that you can look at that and, and use this information. On the HD version, which is what I have in the rack a couple feet away from me, um, we can listen to, of course, the FM, the HD1, the HD2, and the HD3 uh, using the Aaron 655. And that, they're, it's so cool what Innovonics has done. If you go to their website, InnovonicsBroadcast.com, uh, you can demo a lot of their products online. And you can already get a feel for what that product can do just by going through the menus. So uh, if it's unclear to you uh, what, what something does from Innovonics, just go to their website and do an online product demo, direct it yourself, do it yourself, and it's really cool. Innovonics products are available from an amazing dealer. I love these folks at Broadcasters General Store, BGS. Their website, bgs.cc, and they carry all the cool latest. Well, they're, they're the actually Altas. They also carry the uh, uh, Angry Audio Rave console. There's the Quasar XR from Telos Alliance from Axia. Uh, they have access to over 600 manufacturers. And I know, as I like to say at Broadcast General Store, they got some sharp pencils. <laughs> And they also have a, a tracking system that really does a great job of letting you know how quickly you'll receive your broadcast product, where it is in shipping, give you shipping choices, and they're just a delight to deal with. Broadcaster General Store at bgs.cc. All right, I'm here with um, Chris Tarr and Jeff McGinley. I'm Kirk Harnack in Oxford, Mississippi at WBZK. Chris, can you spend a couple minutes and talk to us about the technologies you've put to use in your station group to make IT more efficient and data handling more efficient. Take us on a tour. Sure. Well, we, you know, our our business model is a little bit different. We really, although we have studios, we don't really use them very often. Uh, we, we do just-in-time tracking. So we have uh, our, our trackers uh, put in their tracks just before they air. Um, so we don't really do a whole lot other than sporting events truly live on the air. So, um, our, we have locations where we have, you know, our local locations where we have a studio, but very rarely do they get used. We have a very distributed workforce. Um, one of the things that came up with COVID is, you know, we decided to go to that model and have stayed there. So most of our people, because all of our stations are in Wisconsin and they're all kind of spread out a little bit, we have employees all over Wisconsin who basically work from remote offices. Uh, so we looked at, you know, the way our, our stuff was set up and there's a lot of redundancy and overhead in that we had large studio spaces in several markets. You know, we'd come in we'd buy a group of stations and you know, we'd, we'd have all this space and it was costing us a lot of money. So we decided at some point that, you know, we needed to change that. And we started to take a real hard look. And one of the facilities we have is in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. And it turns out that this facility is really in a nice location. We have the ability to have multiple internet providers in there. So we did. Uh, we did two different completely separate providers into the building. It's got a generator that just is is in great shape. You know, it works really well. It's on a maintenance plan. It's got a lot of space. It's uh, located close to myself and my trusty assistant uh, who can, you know, we can get there very quickly. So originally we started out, we had three stations there when in that building. And again, you know, after we took it over, the studio is pretty well you know, were, were not used much. And the traffic people, you know, from the old company all worked in that building because it was just, it was a, a nation, a, a national group. And so they had, you know, employees in each market. We didn't do that. Um, you know, we have, again, our employees work from their, their home offices. So we have a lot of space there. And we started out with three stations and then we acquired uh, some stations in Eau Claire. And we said, you know, we don't really want to use the, the the building that was up there. The facilities were run down and very old, and and we just weren't gonna gonna work from there. And we said, well, in reality, why would we try to build a facility there 
that we're really not going to use. We can, you know, we can get a small office there for salespeople and things like that and, and maybe a small studio, but there's really no reason to run our operations there. And not only that, but then we'd have to find engineers to fix it. And if something goes bad, it goes wrong. It's a pain. So that was our first kind of dabble into, well, you know, let's try this. Let's put fiber in uh, and, and basically run the, uh, run the radio station from our Fort Atkinson facility. And, you know, basically we'd put, you know, EAS and things at, you know, at the, at the transmitter site and just do fiber delivery there. Uh, so we did, and it worked really, really well. So, uh, you know, we started to think about that. And said, well, you know, what else could we do? Uh, we ended up selling, um, we had an AM and FM station in Racine, Wisconsin. We ended up selling the AM and keeping the FM. But with the sale, the, the studios and offices there went with the AM. So we had kind of this orphan FM station. So we said, well, Let's move that to Fort Atkinson, put fiber to the transmitter site there and, uh, you know, and, and, and do that. You know, this, this first test project worked really well. Well, long story short, we now have something like 12 radio stations running out of that building. And we're, we're, in fact, this weekend moving another one in. And what we've decided to do is, is uh, not only are we, uh, you know, putting more and more stations into this facility, uh, but, we're looking at, you know, we're now starting to virtualize things like, you know, metadata, uh, streaming, uh, audio playback into, into virtualized containers on servers there and doing redundant servers. So, you know, we're getting to the point where, you know, we, it was interesting because we said, well, you know, why don't we, we have some stations in Toma that are in the same situation. Now we have an office in La Crosse, it is staffed. And we said, well, why don't we move the, the Toma, is like 40 miles away, we'll move the Toma stations um, into this lacrosse facility, the audio. We started to think about it, went, why can't we just move it to Ford? <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't really matter where these, these audio servers live. Um, and then, you know, each, each location still has a studio that can override the programming and, and you know, hop, either hop directly to the transmitter or hop through Fort Atkinson and back uh, to the transmitter. But it's starting to, it's actually starting to save us quite a bit of money because we're able to downsize facilities. West Bend was a situation, West Bend, Wisconsin, where we were paying a lot of money for a really large facility there that we just didn't need. You know, we, we just didn't need that much space. So we were able to downsize uh, into a, and that's one of the stations we're moving this weekend. We're able to downsize to a much smaller facility that has one studio and, uh, you know, uh, just an area for some salespeople and things like that. And, you know, we're cutting our rent more than in half uh, in, in what we're paying in lease payments there. And, of course, there's utilities and maintenance and everything else. And, again, the, the positive side is the two tech guys, me and my assistant, who deal with the IT side of things, are literally right down the road. So the more things that we put there for stations that are three hours away, uh, you know, the easier it is. Now, having said that, um, you know, there are some things, what if, you know, the very worst happens and we lose everything or the, the, the fiber at the transitor site goes down? Well, that's where we have, uh, you know, we started doing uh, mirrored servers at those locations that have a copy uh, always running of, uh, of the automation system that's synced with the, with the main studio. So if for some reason the fiber goes down or whatever, um, it will sync and just start playing off of the, the, the system in the, uh, the, uh, the system at the transmitter site. But mm -hmm. the benef the benefit is, is we're able to spend the money at that location and really harden that location and put in some great features that we couldn't afford to do at every place we have. So, for example, that's where um, the, the Burke lives, and we do everything with SM, SNMP. But for our PPM markets, we have, you know, main and, and backup um, encoders. And because of the fiber and everything, I can backfeed the, the encoded audio, and I have that set up where if one of the stations fails encoding, I have an SNMP outlet that will turn off the main, turn on the backup, and, and reset the PPM encoding. So we can have those luxuries and, and those sorts of things, that redundancy, and, uh, you know, we don't have to spend that at every single facility we have. So we can have backup codecs, backup servers, 
you know, all of those things that we couldn't afford to do at every place and invest all of that into this one location. And I just put in my little office over there so I can go in and hide and things. But that's really how, and, and, and this really started where many years ago before virtualization became a thing and, and, you know, the local studio rules were in effect. Um, I had a station that I consulted for that we actually were really ahead of the curve and we put the automation system at the transmitter and did a virtual studio uh, because mm -hmm. they couldn't find space. So that all kind of sprang from there, but it was interesting because it took a lot of buy-in at first because um, my coworker who owns the, the radio stations kept saying, well, you know, the gold standard is an STL, you know, those don't fail. We don't have problems with that. Uh, once I showed him, the fact that with this fiber and these codecs, you can do uncompressed audio, um, you know, with, with fiber, the latency is really low. And we've done a real, I've done a really good job of getting the fiber providers uh, to, you know, the, the, the fiber to be with the same provider so that even though it's public internet access, it stays on their network from end to end. So, uh, you know, and then we use endpoints everywhere. And, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, you know, the firewall system at the fort building has a certificate on all these other things. So, you know, it really, it, you know, in a virtual kind of thing, um, you know, we're not doing virtual mixers or anything because that's just not really our, our model. But we can do sports games where they can dial in and not dial in. It's an old word <laughs> but, i know i know <laughs> uh, you know yeah right so so you know you guys use ip connectivity to get in um we're able to uh with with axia and and gpio and things make all of that happen so yeah it's it's been it's been an interesting learning curve um and, and by the time we're done here uh by the end of the year um i think we'll have 15 stations out of this facility um it's just, you know, the thing we have to be cognizant of is, uh, you know, with, with advertisers and things to let them know that this isn't moving the stations into one place and, you know, moving away from these cities because we still absolutely have a presence everywhere. It's just that we no longer really have to have a studio with a full playout system at each place anymore. It just doesn't, it's just not necessary with technology today. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jeff, uh, I've got a question too. I'd like to ask, but Jeff, are you got any comments on what what Chris just explained and for for their business model? I, I love it. I think that all the all the broadcasting companies are going to be moving to that. If not, if they're not already in the process of doing it, they're they're going to start very soon. Uh, the amount of money that you can save on on rent, lease, utilities, uh, it just it makes sense. It really does. Well, and fortunately, I work for a privately owned regional group, so we're able to move really quick on that. I mean, it literally was like, I think it's it was a year ago when we bought this, this station, La Crosse, and did that pilot project, and it worked so well and said, well, why aren't we doing this with everything? And, and literally, it was just like a complete buy-in. We just, it was like a rocket after that. And now... You know, it, every, everywhere we go, you know, it's like, well, can we get fiber there? <laughs> you know, it's, let's see what we can do. Um, you know, I've got translator sites now that have fiber to them, uh, you know, because that's just, it works so well now. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's one of the great things about working for a small private group like this is, you know, the, once the owner has buy-in on it, it's like, yeah, that, that's what we're going to do now. Almost seems like we need to do a show from from Chris's uh, office, and you've been at your office before. But I mean, do do a tour, of, yeah, of, of what you're doing there. Yeah, once we once we get it done, it's a little rough right now because it's been so quick that we've just been you know loading stuff in. Like Sunday night, we're going to do a move, and you know it'll just take a couple hours. But we're you know we're going to get some new racks, and I've got a whole building UPS that's going to be get, get installed uh to you know right now we just have all these little ups's around but i've got a a whole building ups to run the racks and and that sort of thing so um once we get it done we'll do a tour we we, we know that whether it's small town radio or big city radio it, it is important to be able to to maybe bring dignitaries in or have a place where you can interview people who have something to say um how do you handle that now in markets that that don't have a, a, a real studio per se how do you handle interviewing the mayor or having some kind of, I don't know, a fundraiser, you know, something we, we besides actually, the ordinary program. Yeah, we absolutely do have a studio in each location. We have uh, oh, okay. Axia. Yeah, we have an element or IQ in one place with an element in another. And we just use, uh, you know, we have codecs there. So um, it's really easy with playout systems in Axia to just 
yeah, you know, we have a, our entire networks on a WAN, so you uh, could really mm. easily bring up the screen for the the playout system in each studio, click a button, take it live, and and go. Um, so we that's that's how we do it. And instead of then having to again outfit several studios for several radio stations in one cluster that will probably never need to use at the same time, each building has a really nice main studio really well outfitted that we use as a multi-purpose studio okay okay gotcha wow i got a feeling chris if i could spend a few days with you and travel around a few different sites at every place we go my reaction would be holy cow that's pretty cool that's that's what an efficient it's, way to do that it's well it's a lot of fun because i'm encouraged to ex experiment um, again, one of the great things about having, you know, privately locally owned group is I'm encouraged to try these things out and, you know, I'm encouraged to find ways to create efficiencies with technology. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, he actually takes a lot of pride in some of this cutting edge stuff that we're doing, uh, because, you know, it's, it's a kind of a batch room. Well, our radio stations are doing this. Um, so I, I'm really, I'm encouraged to be able to do that. And so it's been a wild ride because as soon as we try something and, and I, I know we're running out of time, but one of the, again, one of the really nice things about our, uh, our, my coworker who runs the group is he is very, he's very, 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 uh, cognizant of the end product for the user. So processing audio quality, all of these things, um, are really, really important to him. So you know, when we went from having these analog studios with analog stuff to all uh, live wire and digital and codecs and, you know, uncompressed audio from start to finish. And he listens to our stations now and he's just like, I can't tell you how great it is for our listeners and our business partners that we just have these, you know, stations with just this pristine audio and, and all of these things. So uh, that also helps that, you know, and he's a long-term operator you know he's been in business for years and he's gonna it's family owned so it's gonna go to his sons later so you know he spends and builds long term and so this stuff kind of it's not a matter of how cheap can we do it it's a matter of how well we can do it and how smart we can do it so there you go wow wow that's that's cool hey we are running uh low on time um we're gonna take our last break and when we come back i want to hear some final thoughts from jeff mcginley uh, can't give you any secrets, I'm sure, but you know, where is he seeing uh, a group like Summit Media? Where's he seeing that company going technology wise? What innovative things is, 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 is he looking at? Whatever he can disclose. I don't know. I haven't talked this over with, with Jeff yet. So, you know, he may say, Kirk, mm, can't say anything. <laughs> it's coming up. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our amazing friends at Angry Audio. And Chris, don't walk away from that microphone because you've got another thing or two. <laughs> to say about angry audio don't you well here's the thing here's a, here's a great example of of the the company that that we run is um that audio quality and those types of situations where if we can find something that really works well we're all in so let's talk about the c level processor from angry audio uh you know with with you know Ariane with translintech uh dropping Ariane and bw broadcast kind of in a state of flux right now. Uh, you know, they don't make compellers anymore. Uh, there really wasn't, there's kind of a hole there for a, a good preprocessor. Well, Corny and Catfish at Angry Audio came up with the C versions of the processor, the C4, the C level, uh, that, that do these things for stream processing on the air processing. Uh, so we took one of those Chameleon C level processors and put it on the air at one station. And uh, my coworker, took one listen to the audio and said, that is amazing. We need those. So we bought 25 of them and put them on each one of our stations. And what this is, is basically it replaces the AGC on your audio processor. And, you know, if you're like us, we don't, you know, we do have some, some cutting edge processors. Some of the ones we have are also older. This breathes brand new life into your audio processing. If you have an 8100 or even, you know, uh, an 8400 or an Omnia One or, you know, we have them in front of a bunch of different things. This really does. It breathes new life into your audio, audio processing. It's multi-band. It's got Corny's touch on there with, uh, uh, you know, the, the control for uh, or the, the sound quality with bass and treble and brightness. 
it really is a secret sauce and you know there's very few adjustments on it but don't let that fool you because uh, you know it was difficult at me at first to look at this and go well, there's really nothing to change on here but the the phrase that i came up with was in corny we trust i put it in i let it do its <laughs> thing and i'll tell you the result is amazing uh, again, we we heard it one you know on the air after one day we realized that this was something we wanted on we wanted this sound on all of our stations. It's clean, it's open, it's bright, and it really does get your audio into that sweet spot where you can take your uh, main audio processor and tweak it right into that that little slot that that sounds the best, and your audio will stay there. But it won't sound like it. It won't sound flat and compressed and, you know, on a brick wall. It's very open and clean sounding, but very consistent for that processor down the line. So give your audio processing new life. Check it out. It is the Angry Audio uh, Audio Chameleon C-Level. They also have, again, a chameleon for your audio streams as well and for different pro uh, different processing, processing needs. And they're coming out with the mic processors too, the the Rebel and... and uh, the uh, uh what is the other one the rebel and the smooth smooth Smooth. yeah the smooth yes they're all in that kind of line of chameleons corny's uh processing designs for angry audio they they have actually have there is an adjustment on there it's it's two positions there's amazing and off yeah <laughs> right you said it and That's forget it. it so yeah go to go to angryaudio.com and check it out i guarantee you you know you get one try it out um, I think you're going to be, you know, you'll be sold on them too. I, I love them. All right. And Max Connect Wireless is another one of our sponsors. Uh, we're going to let you hear from Gary Morrill real quick. We'll be right back. I'm Gary Morrill, Midwest Regional Director of Engineering for Alpha Media. When I first spoke with Josh Bone about Max Connect, he told me they'd work great for remote transmitter sites where connectivity was a challenge. And you know, he's absolutely right. We even have sites where we're using this as a backup to our STL using Mac Connect's dual carrier option, and it works perfectly. We also have times where we need to be able to get out to a venue where it's kind of challenging because everybody and his brother is trying to stream video at the same time, like at a big sporting event. And you know what? Our data gets through every time because it's prioritized packet data. It works for us. It'll work for you. Max Connect. Check it out. And Max Connect absolutely saved my bacon right here in Oxford, Mississippi, because we were ready to go. We had the studio built, we had the transmitter built, and we had no fiber internet at the transmitter site. Uh, the company putting it in, there was some miscommunication. They were weeks behind. And so I grabbed my Max Connect box, popped it at the transmitter site, and we had terrific connectivity for weeks until the fiber got put in. So it saved our bacon, absolutely. We had all our programming done, it was just terrific. Max Connect Wireless, the Max Connect Group also provides lots of engineering services and, uh, uh, and, and tower services too now. So check them out at maxconnect.com. Uh, we'll have the link for that in the show notes. All right, uh, we're about to wrap things up here, but Jeff McGinley uh, is our special guest today, VP of Summit Media, VP Engineering, Summit Media. Jeff, what can you tell us about the future and your your vision and some of the things you see you guys doing? Well, I wish I could. I can only give you a preview of what's happening right now, but we are yeah. about to roll out a uh, a huge company wide product that, or a project that's going to change some pretty fundamental stuff for us. But uh, I can't tell you right now. I just can't. Oh, so, so as soon as I tell you what, I'll let you know when we roll it out and you can have me back on and I'll explain it to you. But that's it it's, uh, it's going to be company wide. It's going to be huge. Mm -hmm. And I uh, can't wait to get it, get it on the air. Does it surround any technologies we've discussed here? Today? Yeah. I don't no? think so. No. Mm -mm. Okay. Nope. Even, he's he's right. got well, these things. I think Chris, I think Chris might have touched on it a, a little bit with, with the, you know, him. He's describing his facility, but yeah. he's he's coming up with a brand new way to play music. It's this this piece of vinyl that has grooves on it, and you put it down on the record player, and you you play it, and you actually handle the music rather than worry about it getting erased on a hard drive somewhere. Yeah, but then it can get scratched. <laughs> I I, I can tell you what it's not. It, it's not oxygen free copper, and it's not shun mook rocks. <laughs> It may, it, but it may be green markers for the edges it's, of the CD. It's, it's, it's that unidirectional cable 
you know, oh, that, that only goes it. in one direction. <laughs> and if you put it in the right direction, the atoms <clears throat> line up and make sure the audio is pristine going in the direction gosh. that you plug it in. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. All right. Uh, well, th this has been delightful. Uh, I got, I am just delighted with the way we're working with this stuff here. Uh, it's still early days. Uh, you know, sometimes we get an internet disconnect. The jock has to reconnect, but he's not off the air because all the stuff is at the transmitter site. Uh, and so we use, um, let me back out of the way here. In fact, I wanted to give you just a little bit more of, of a view. Uh, this computer right here this one is like i said it's the remote view here i can take it out of uh out of the full screen mode so here's a browser it's just a browser it's it's just chrome and then here's the the part that um is connected for audio uh so you can see here it's been connected for 12 hours and 35 minutes so it uh, looks like chris came in this morning about 4 30 in the morning and and uh, uh, you know connected that up and and he comes in right here over here is our remote access into our automation. It happens to be a um, uh, Playout One automation system. And that's uh, and we have three of them at the transmitter site, one for each of three formats, but this is the rock format. And just to keep things really simple, we use this little uh, program right here uh, to effect um, uh, routing changes. So uh, we could use Pathfinder from, uh, from Axia, but instead we, we just have real simple changes. So we can either put the automation directly on the air, we can put the console on the air. In fact, I can do that right, right there. Now the console is on the air, but it's you know playing the automation. And now the, uh, there you go. Now the, uh, the automation is directly on the air, bypassing the console. So now I can turn that off and we'd still be on the air. And then this is actually a local console. This is an IQS over here. There we go. That's our IQS console. And then this finally, this last screen is, uh, it's on the same computer. These two are on the same computer. This one's just used for um, uh, multi-track editing and, and, and recording. So there you go. That's a quick tour of the, of the studio. How about that? Chris Tarr, thank you so much for being with us. Jeff McGinley, short notice man, thank you so much for being with us. I appreciate you taking your time, and I'm so glad. You're living close to me, brother. We got to go have a steak dinner sometime. Absolutely. Yeah, love to love to love to see you down in Birmingham. Portland was a long ways, you know. I didn't get there very often. <laughs> All righty, uh, and Chris, I'll see you in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, in a couple weeks. Looking forward to it. Yes. Uh, in fact, I get to introduce you. Uh, I get to who? introduce your session. What? So, Are you getting up that that yeah. early on Tuesday morning? Well, you know, I'm on the committee, so I'm going to be there the whole time. But uh, so I'm trying to think of a good way to introduce you. Well, we'll see what happens. Oh, gosh, I can't imagine. <laughs> One thing we're going to do, Chris, in our session, I just tried this uh, at the Mississippi Broadcasters. We're going to do a live remote broadcast with a Chromebook, literally a $269 touchscreen Chromebook. We're going to do a live remote broadcast to this studio cool. right here. We'll do it from Wisconsin Broadcasters, and the audio quality will be just perfect. wonderful, amazing. Awesome. How about that? Awesome. All right. Chris Tarr and Jeff McGinley, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, listeners and viewers, for being with This Week in Radio Tech. I'm so glad that, that you've been with us, and we're going to see you next week. Big thanks to Suncast for being quick on the controls and making the show look great, publishing it and all that. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech.